people welcome to the supplement from the 3rd of November 2024 so first of all I just wanted to start with a little apology I haven't had any time in the past couple of weeks even at the weekends to find sort of 30 45 minutes an hour whatever I need to be able to upload a video or uh, upload to any of the podcast platforms or anything like that so I hope you'll forgive me um, it's been an extremely busy couple of weeks. I can't remember ever having had such a, an intense couple of weeks in my professional career ever at any point. That's how, how amazing it's been. And primarily because of what was speculated to be happening in the budget, of course. Um, and of course, this week we're going to get into that. So uh, as you'll know, if you've listened before, I always like to start with a quote. And this week's is, Rachel, it's too late to say you're sorry. Now, in my head, that's going to the tune of Kaylee by Marillion, if you're familiar with the song. A um, little bit of a, a bit of artistic license on the lyrics there as well, but you'll understand why. So before I get started in earnest, I just wanted to urge you to get those tickets bought for the next Property Business Workshop that I run with Rod Turner. Thursday, the 16th of January 2025 will be the one. We're going to be covering productivity, planning for the year, strategic planning, and financial accounting and bookkeeping. And why are we doing that? Because we constantly see property businesses struggling with appropriate financial reporting, accounting and bookkeeping and making the same mistakes time and time again. So this will help you to get a complete handle on the financial performance of your company or group when you aren't at a level yet where you can afford a CFO or a financial controller. And as always, it will be an action-packed content-filled day which will stand alone in helping to advance your understanding as a property business owner so there is a link and the super early bird tickets have got a genuine 25 plus percent discount on them they're available in limited numbers you just need to go to bit.ly forward slash pbw five pbw5 so there's obviously no hiding from the fact and no doubt that this week's deep dive will focus almost exclusively on the autumn financial statement the budget from this week and we'll see if Rachel has earned her derogatory nickname or not. So I called this week's piece Rachel Thieves with a question mark, um, not a, an allegation that I'm alleging myself, um, but obviously it is a nickname that's been passed around the media over the recent weeks. And did she earn that this week or not? But really, more importantly, who are the real losers going to be from this budget? So before I tuck into that, and this isn't the shortest one I've ever delivered, let's face it. I'm still going to crack on with the usual suspects and keep our structure. So, Chris Watkin, first of all, asked himself that question one more time. What's currently happening in the UK property market? Uh, Chris is a property stats guru. If you don't know him, he analyzes all the data from UK portals, which is aggregated by him, aggregated for him by a piece of software called 20EA on a weekly basis. And I just love real time or as real time as possible snapshots and pictures of the market that we can piece together. There's nothing better for staying informed. Listings took a dip, with no doubt the budget timing causing that little bit more uncertainty in the market. Budgets have, of course, made a difference, and also they've been announced at different times over the past few years. 2022 will spring to mind, of course, naturally, and so the week-to-week -week comparisons are less useful than they often can be this week and next week, really. But sold subject to contracts weren't hurt too much, though, with 26,000 nearly being marked sold subject to contract, in the week in question, 24% uh, higher than the same week 12 months ago. So let's not lose sight of that difference and how much better shape the market is in than it was 12 months ago. The uncertainty didn't put deals off from being done. Although of course, sole subject to contract doesn't mean people don't pull out, of course. And then the fall through stayed at about one in four sales at the moment, which is very much in line with the seven year average. It's next week's figure that we're gonna have to watch and the week afters with care. So. Net sales moved ahead of 2022's number at the same point in the year this week. Still a healthy print on the year and 5.7% above the pre-pandemic average of 2017 to 19. The real-time market take has to change after the budget for reasons I'll get into later. But the facet that's going to grip this market in the next five months or so is this new stamp duty cliff from 250k currently back down to 125k. On transactions of 250k or above that are not first time buyer transactions and not second home or corporate property investor transactions, it'll be worth two and a half grand. And then on transactions between 125 and 250, it'll be worth 2% of the difference above 125. 
So look, you might think, well, it's not big money in a property transaction, is it? But just trust me on this one from experience, it will create hype and hype is all that's needed to force people into transacting faster than they otherwise would. It won't be massive, but it will be meaningful. It isn't all irrational behavior around tax either. If you're borrowing 90 or 95% of the money against the property, then another 1% on the purchase price might be eight or 9% more cash you've got to find, or it might even be 16 or 18% more cash you've got to find if you're using a 95% mortgage. So what does this mean for property investors? Well, list your sales strategically. Perhaps watch the market for a week, perhaps just list now. Certainly be prepared to list on a day and get carried away with the usual hype. Or alternatively, make an impact in the first weekend of the new year after the kids are back to school. It depends on what you're selling and where you're selling it. If you're selling investor-only stock, you might need to sit on it until 2025. I think the auction sales are going to be tumbleweed in November for the vendors. There's still the same money out there looking for the right lots and the bargains, of course, but many buyers are going to be looking to load the entire new 2% stamp duty extra onto the vendor so that their already tight margins hold up. Plenty more on that later, though, of course. That's just a soup song. So, as usual, I go into the macro. We have to look at the Bank of England money and credit report. Um, we've got to look at the nationwide house price index. That's our fare, of course. It's that time of the month. And then there's room for a look at the final manufacturing PMI for October too. And then our friends, the gilts and swaps, who basically after this week have cemented their place in the supplement macro summary for at least another year, let's just say. That will then segue nicely into the budget. So the money in credit report, just a reminder, what makes the headlines from this report? Well, the number of mortgage approvals usually. So this is a report on September. And if you take a rounded view rather than saying, oh, Wednesday's ruined everything and all the rest of it, there's going to be a difference between September, which is a naturally buoyant month for listings and sales and an OK month for completions. October with that uncertainty, which affected business this more but people work for businesses and own businesses that sell and buy property um, so that more uncertainty as we neared the budget and then November where I think people are going to be working to try and understand budget implications for a week two weeks maybe for a whole month and then December as it gets naturally quieter the naturally quieter sales market but obviously of, often plenty of completions are scheduled albeit they're front loaded in the month so what else do we like to look at in the report money supply, and also any signs of credit pressure or over leverage in any area, personal loans, unsecured debt, for example, and overall credit health. So what did the report say for September? Well, on a net basis, mortgages were paid down by 300 million pounds. So on a net lending basis, less money was, was put out there in September this year. Approvals for new house purchases mortgages though, went over the magic 65,000 for the month, just about 65,600 not a lot more than the month before but really that 65k is the bottom end of a really quite healthy market when you're getting that level of mortgage approvals or at least it was before the budget the highest level since august 2022 when the level was 72,000 approvals and remortgages were back over the 30,000 mark at 30.8k the net consumer credit was up by 1.2 billion on the month and money supply was up fairly significantly by 0.6% why do we look at the money supply? Well, because we expect that money to find a home and it can be inflationary. Although the money supply is still not up as high as where it was in September, October 2022. Then the effective interest rate, it dropped to 4.76% on newly drawn mortgages. So everyone who drew a mortgage in September uh, completed on a property is paying an average of 4.76%. And then the rate on the outstanding stock of debt moved from 3.72 to 3.74. So we're just about a full 100 basis points apart now on existing versus new debt. So that average is still climbing month on month because it's more expensive than the existing because, of course, some people are still lucky enough to be sitting on cheap mortgages from years ago. So consumer credit growth stayed at 7.5% year on year, which isn't sustainable in the long run and needs to be monitored. But really, it's symptomatic of the cost of living crisis and the reinflation of debt after the pandemic, when a lot of it was paid down. The question is, what does it look like in another six to 12 months time, really, rather than sensationalising the current figures? Interest rates are at new highs, but 22 to 23 percent on credit card and overdraft debt 
compared to 20 to 21 percent during much of the time series isn't an incredible problem on its own. And then the final conclusion from the report is that lending to small and medium sized enterprises is still in a shrink phase rather than a growth one. It has improved, but still low single digit negative growth per year in SME lending. I can't imagine the budget will be inspiring confidence in SMEs to go out and grow. And then, almost in concert with many recent reports, Nationwide reported the the breaks going on in October in the housing market. 0.1% up month on month in prices, 2.4% year on year. Their chief economist didn't change his overall impression of the future housing market path, and you can't blame him. Uh, He still sees gradual growth with affordability improving, thanks to incomes continuing to improve. Next year might prove to be a sticking point there with employers' national insurance contributions taking up a bigger share of the pie. You also see slowly decreasing interest rates, which sounds like a fair shout, and they usually just ignore the supply side constraints, expecting them not to influence prices too much. Although we know from previous weeks that supply has been particularly poor in terms of new units and housing starts, and they have not yet really picked up any meaningful pace. So instead, Nationwide concentrate on the move of the nil rate band in stamp duty for the retail buyers back from that 250 to 125 that I talked about earlier. And also the first time buyer nil rate, which is coming back from 425,000 to 300,000. They can't see anything other than a really busy three month period between January and March, which I'd be inclined to agree with. And then they see three to six month period of weakness afterwards. I would say that weakness is much more likely to be particularly truncated nearer to April and early May but that will play out over that sort of period that they're talking about. I supported that with a nice graph which I've used as the image so if you check out my LinkedIn you'll see the image on there or the Partners in Property website. So they recognise a lower swing than normal after this stamp duty cliff based on the fact the numbers involved and the percentages involved are not quite as stark as they've been in previous stamp duty cliffs. In the Midlands for example, around 10% of first-time buyer transactions will be hit by the transition back down from 425 to 300. It's going to be, as so often these days, the southern regions and the east that it primarily impacts. 40% of the first-time buyer transactions in the southeast will be impacted, so it will vary regionally. And what's their straightforward take at the nationwide on the move to 5% additional stamp duty? Well, They say the Chancellor announced an increase in the higher rate of stamp duty for additional dwellings by two percentage points to 5%, which took effect on the 31st of October. Based on data for the year to June 2024, this would affect around 194,000 transactions, around one in five residential transactions in England and Northern Ireland. We estimate for a typical buy-to-let purchase, this would add approximately £4,000 to stamp duty costs. Consequently, this may dampen demand in this part of the housing market. So you can do the maths there. They see the average buy-to-let purchase as about 200K, adding 4K to the cost. Now, what I'd love to know is how they think there have been 194,000 transactions in the past 12 months. One in five of the transactions taking place is definitely not reflective of, for example, the mortgage data, which has suggested that one in every £11 or so of mortgage money has been used for buy-to-let. It could be there's a glut of cash buyers of investment property, of course, although it seems an unlikely time for cash buyers to really ramp up their activity. One in five being second homes is, of course, not the same as one in five being buy-to-let. And this sort of figure leaves me scratching my head a little, and I'd love to understand more about the nationwide source data. Perhaps they'll share some more of it in the future. We can always hope. What we do know, though, I think, is that adding £4,000 to each transaction on average will not increase transaction volume of this nature. It just economically won't happen, right? And then quick segue to the PMIs, because manufacturing was also finalised, and I felt it was a bit like the pathetic fallacy, as they would say in English literature. You know, when something bad is about to happen in the story, so it starts raining, thundering and lightning, things like that. So the PMI for manufacturing dipped under 50 in the October final figure to 49.9, the tiniest fraction under 50 and a few basis points below its flash print from earlier in October. Psychologically important? Not really, but a warning signal? Well, possibly. Reduced new order intakes mean output growth was reined in. Simple as that. On the bright side, input price inflation eased sharply. 
Now, this is the first time the PMI has been below 50 for April in manufacturing, and manufacturing has struggled since the pandemic for a whole variety of reasons, but apart from anything else, because demand has gone down for manufactured goods, um, some of that being cost of living related, of course. So a modest increase in employment, happily, but citations of the wait and see kind of approach that everyone's expecting after the budget. Firms waited, they saw, and not many in manufacturing would have liked what they saw because there's a heavy emphasis on minimum or wages pegged to minimum in people heavy businesses, which do the bulk of the employing in the manufacturing sector, of course. As you might expect, though, the next report is the one most hotly anticipated to see the real impact of the budget changes in confidence and forward planning. OK, on to the bonds and swap markets, then. Uh, something approaching a bit of a black armband. We got an entire black top here. Um, we went about 0.2% the wrong way over the course of the week. Monday's open on the five-year gilt 4.139 and closed at 4.324. Thursday's close was 4.323, suggesting that the market had, by the end of Wednesday, by the end of Thursday, sorry, absorbed all of Wednesday's news, although the US elections and the Bank of England meeting next week will no doubt have an impact on the pricing once more. The Sonia swaps preserved their discount on Thursday's close in the gilts and closed at 4.028, almost exactly 0.3% below the gilts, as we've seen over the past few weeks. Long may that last, but it needs to. This sees mortgage rates just the wrong side of 6% as a best guess for a limited company five-year fix. And investment grade yields on my calculations climbed to 8.61% at the moment. These are the most miserable figures I can remember for some months in this sector. However, one year ago, the five-year Sonia swap was 4.419%, so we do need to put all of this into context. So, have we had a Liz Truss moment or a Kamikaze budget? No, we definitely haven't. However, this does provide us with the perfect segue to, keep, to get on with the deep dive for the budget, which I'll waste no further time in doing. So, I asked that question, did Rachel earn her nickname this week that the meanies in the media had proposed for her, Rachel Thieves? Some will say yes, of course. I'm going to attempt, as usual, to remain apolitical and stick with factual, dispassionate economic analysis. Let's see if I can succeed. It was a long old speech, really. We had the same rhetoric wheeled out at the beginning, which is really starting to grind now on many people listening to it. The 22 billion black hole, the fault of the Tories. I'm sure the comms people feel that we need these constant reminders. But personally, I just see it and think, well, we knew the last swap weren't doing a great job. So as a nation, we saw it, we called it out, and we voted significantly with our feet, which is why the Tories took such a kicking. In a week which has seen Kemi Badenoch also elected as leader of the Conservative Party, and a poll was released showing the Conservatives actually ahead, 29, 28, 17, 13, and that's Conservatives, Labour, Reform, Lib Dems, it did feel like the promises from the manifesto, which were largely ridiculous and simply a way of buying their way into power, in my view, were bent so far out of shape that it was difficult not to see them as broken. Growth, 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 you'll remember that. Where, where, where would be my current retort if I was on the other side of the house? Not increasing national insurance? Can't really claim to have kept that pledge, can they, anymore? The Institute for Fiscal Studies, noted as one of, if not the most reliable and middle-of-the-road think tanks, wasted no time in saying it was a clear breach of the manifesto commitments. Let's keep the economics really easy here and summarise that part, first of all, as the biggest impact in one go. So what happened? Well, a decrease in the threshold at which employers start to pay national insurance on wages from £9,100 to £5,000 for the next tax year. This is significant for anyone employing more than four full-time equivalents on minimum wage. So anyone with a wage bill of about hundred grand or more as a really, really rough rule of thumb. Why is that the marker? Well, because the employer's national insurance allowance, the discount applied for small companies, was moved from £5,000 a year to £10,500 a year of employer's national insurance before you have to pay it. So, all of those intending to offer their staff a pay rise next year, if we focus on businesses paying minimum or close to minimum, it isn't about intention but about legal action, of course, are paying 6.7% more on minimum wage. So that's a further increase. 6.7% on minimum will add 1% onto employers' national insurance too at 15% and a 
another 0.34% on mandatory pension contributions, meaning a staff cost increase of a minimum wage member of staff of 8.05% or thereabouts. And that's before we consider the move in the threshold as above from 9,100 down to 5,000, which would mean an extra £615 per year for all staff above those four full-time equivalents I mentioned above. So that would add roughly another 2.7% on the cost of a full-time equivalent staff member, making it a total increase in staff costs of 10.75% for national minimum wage staff members. This isn't far off the increase in April 2024, which was around 11.3%. And if you've got more minimum wage staff members who are between 18 and 21, for example, the increase is even more in percentage terms. So I hope that you can see quite easily from that that people heavy businesses are hit hard, particularly if they're paying around that lowest legal level. You can probably understand why many don't have much sympathy for those businesses, but let's just talk who we're actually talking about. Well, care groups, restaurants, hospitality or hotels, pubs and clubs, retail, cleaners, arts and entertainment, and then vehicle repair and agriculture to a lesser extent. The ONS have released an interesting paper this week, which I'll analyse in the future, about low and high pay in the UK. Low pay, as they've defined it, was almost completely wiped out as of April 2024, and moves made in this budget will reinforce that ever further. The definition they use of low paid is not within two thirds of median pay. Now, there's always a danger in arbitrary definitions, of course, but that's one for another day, as I say. These changes raise 25 billion a year or thereabouts for the for the satchel for the for UK PLC, except they didn't because about one fifth of that 25 billion comes from the public sector, which of course comes out of the satchel. So that leaves 20 billion then, right? Not quite, because that extra 20 billion reduces corporation tax, of course, and so it becomes more like 15 billion then. Well, not exactly. And this can only be because not all companies make a profit and also not all companies pay the 25% rate of corporation tax. Of course, the first 50 grand is still taxed at 19%. The figure they settled on in the end, roughly, was around 16 billion. So, really small businesses are better off before considering the minimum wage increase, which means they won't be better off, of course, but comparatively, they're not hit as hard. SMEs with more than that 100K an annum wage bill who employ a vast percentage of the employees in the UK, 90% or more of the private sector employees are hit hard in an environment where prices have, or maybe I should say had, stabilised and inflation was right back under control. And yes, inflation is going to creep in here. So I want to just talk about the economic reality, really, because I can't help but think Labour are patting themselves on the back here, primarily because they don't and have never run an SME as a front bench unit, as a near whole. Yes, we've got to consider Polly Gustafsson, of course, the new Minister of State for Investment, who ran Dark Trace. But they see this as a nice raid on business and the coffers of the wealthy, the wealth creators, the people they were meant to be encouraging, right? Sorry, I can't resist. So what really happens when costs move up this much and the environment won't swallow huge price increases? Well, one of a number of things. The incidence of this price rise is only going in three directions. Number one, swallowed by the company who accept continue trading at a lower margin. Number two, swallowed by the employees who don't get a pay rise next year. Well, that's not even an option for national minimum wage employers, of course. Or swallowed by the customers of those businesses who get a four to eight percent increase passed on in the prices that they pay. And it really just depends on how people intensive those businesses are. And in the real world, well, of course, you're not choosing between one, two and three. There'll be a blend. Right? Textbook economics will tell you this is about the price elasticity of demand, which I talk about in the context of housing on occasion. But the simple way to understand this is just to think about petrol or diesel prices. Right? Petrol or diesel goes up 10 percent. Demand for them doesn't go down 10 percent. It does go down because affordability kicks in and also because alternative methods of transport become more attractive. But it goes down one or two percent. That's what we describe as inelastic, right? And housing very much behaves like petrol and diesel because people need roofs over their heads. So in some of the sectors mentioned above, you can probably look through the inelastic and the elastic, and you can usually find the numbers via research papers as well. So care homes, for example, well, likely to be inelastic because it involves housing, there's not enough supply, and supply is falling. It reminds me a bit of the rental market overall, to be honest. Leisure activity 
capabilities well like the elastic because you do them in your spare time and affordability and substitutes are easier to find come up with and think of so look on the other side a national minimum wage earner will earn 6.7 percent more but anyone working 20 hours a week or more at that level will only see 4.82 percent of that in their pockets because the tax thresholds mean they lose 28 percent of that in tax and they lose more if they're contributing to their pension so they can afford an inflation rate of 4.82% to stay still, of course. And this sort of bottom-up approach to consumption does feed into economic activity to a large extent. The lower paid have a tendency to consume 100% or even more, because they've become more credit worthy and they use that fact, of any pay rise that they do get. There's some slippage there though, isn't there? 10.75% cost to the company, 4.82% increase in the pay packet. And that's the massive inefficiency of tax, of course, and that cannot possibly stimulate growth. And that's one really simple example, or at least I tried to keep it simple anyway. And that really wants that's really covered what I wanted to cover in terms of the macro consequences of the budget and some of the real numbers that I know people have been asking me for in a hopefully accessible way for this budget. And that leaves us based on time constraints and attention spans, of course, with the property implications. Now, I may well return to this budget next week although there's going to be some major news events to consider by the time we come back next Sunday, given the Bank of England meeting, which is a quarterly major one with a full report, let alone what's going on in the United States. So you'll know what's happened by now on, from the property perspective. I've thrown some references out to it already. HRAD, which is a new acronym on me or the first time I've seen it, the higher rate on additional dwellings. That was increased from 3% to 5% for individuals, limited companies, and other corporate structures. The change was a next day one, so it didn't create a cliff edge. This goes on top of the other stamp duty changes already referred to above as well. I mean, of course, you are gonna see more fall throughs come into the market over the next couple of weeks for people who hadn't exchanged, but we'll get into that later on. So a little rundown, a quick exercise with a little reminder, this is about England because stamp duty is a devolved tax these days. So remember, all of these are marginal rates. So you pay a little bit more, a percentage more above a certain point, apart from the £40,000 band, which is a genuine cliff edge. So if you buy a property for 39999 you pay zero. If you buy it for 40 grand as of Thursday this week, you're paying two grand. So it's a huge cliff edge at 40K. So below 40K, no stamp. 40K to 125K, well, before the 31st of October, that was 3%. Now it's 5%. For the next portion, it's more complicated. Before the 31st of October, 3%. This is between 125 and 250. After the 31st of October, but before April the 1st next year, 5%. After April the 1st next year, as a second purchase, anything above 125 grand will have a 7% stamp duty on the marginal point thereof. And then for the next portion, 250 to 925 grand, well, before the 31st of October, but that was eight. And after the 31st of October, it's 10% on that marginal difference. So I don't think I need to go on up through the bands. Everyone can see how chunky that is. You know, the top rate is now 17%, but for an overseas buyer of a second home, it would be 19% because they get a further 2% premium to consider. So Paul Johnson, as I mentioned earlier, is still the IFS director at the moment. He is leaving to become the provost of Queen's College Oxford put it very calmly. I have said again and again that stamp duty land tax is among the most economically damaging of all of our taxes and yet we have it increasing again says Johnson. The increase may just be on second properties but it is renters who will pay part of the cost as the supply of such properties falls. Now he's spoken out against SDLT many times. He sees a better alternative as an ongoing tax on owned properties or land which is more like the American system. SDLT clogs up transaction numbers and chokes them as he sees it and of course he's right so let's go back to our logic followed through from the employer's national insurance situation what will happen on the back of all this well vendors might roll over and just accept offers that are two percent lower purchasers might roll over and just pay two percent more or the middle ground somewhere between the two depending on the motivation of both parties and we all know that number three is the most likely Margins are cut once again and transaction volumes will fall. 
So is this woe is me or woe is us? Not necessarily. There are further nuances too, which we'll get into. Because there's a second side to this, of course. What I'm seeing metaphorically as the moat, right? How easy is it now to buy more property? Well, it's harder and it's more costly. No one can deny that. What does that mean for those who already own property? Well, it means less competition. Why? Well, what we would normally call dispassionately organic wastage, right? People leave the market on the supply side every day. Had enough is the popular narrative, but death, debt, divorce tells more of a story. Tenant moves on, vacant possession, a large percentage of that stock will go on the open market or into the auction market if condition is particularly poor as a rule. Tenant in situ, much more likely to go straight to auction. What features is almost any property share if it's been held for an average of 15 years? That's the most recent number I can find on the average hold time for a buy to let landlord. Hamptons quoted 17 years in 2015 after one of their surveys, which compared at the time to 14 years for the average owner occupier. Now in recent years, the owner occupier number has been closer to 22 years, but let's just stick with 15 years as the idea. What are you gonna get over 15 years? Capital growth, right? So there's headroom to play with on exit. Many times we see and are involved in transactions where the proceeds cover the mortgage just about, or the vendor is even needing to go into their pocket but we're buying professionally, and that's what you'd expect from us. Generally, there will be a capital gain, not changed from a property perspective in the budget as it goes, and some residual equity on the vast majority of ex-rental transactions. So, basic economics again. Less new stock in terms of new supply to the market due to a higher cost of entry. Organic wastage the same. No reason to assume otherwise, or certainly no reason to assume why there would be less organic wastage. Indeed, the theoretical at the moment is that inorganic wastage, other reasons for exits, is up and going up further. And there is a demographic argument that when buy-to-let was booming from 1996 and the advent of the buy-to-let mortgage onwards, <coughs> that boom period went on to about 2014. So if you tack 15 years or 22 or 25 years onto those numbers, if you prefer, you can see when the boom people will move 25 years on just in terms of age apart from anything else and start to look at divesting of properties and that's something we'll have to consider some of it's already started happening but that really lives in the period from 2020 to 2045 as a general rule <coughs> so inorganic wastage so other reasons for exit is up and going up further there's certainly it's harder to quantify because we don't have real-time measures and brilliant sources of data so it gets a bit theoretical for the moment although there are some measures that I refer to on occasion that attempt to measure this. For example, Zoopla looks at properties for sale that were listed on Zoopla for rent within the previous few years, which will under declare the amount of ex rental sales, of course, because some will have had much longer tenancies than a few years. <coughs> End of a cheap mortgage term, not to be replaced by cheap rates at any time in the near future. Well, that phenomenon is going to continue until early 2027, with the majority now all dropped off by the end of this year. I'm talking about all of the old two-year cheap money and then 40% of the five-year cheap money. That's the assumption I'm working on. So three years left of that phenomenon. And then, of course, a hostile, as far as the landlord is concerned, renters' rights bill going through the Houses of Parliament. In current form, as previously analysed, hostile particularly to student HMO landlords and probably a lot less damaging than the noise being made on the, on the rest of it in current form. There will be higher costs, though, once again, with a nationwide licensing scheme, of course. We often hear and look at all this from the lens of the landlord. That's natural, of course, but consider the tenant. And back to what Paul Johnson said, it is renters who will pay part of the cost as the supply of such properties falls. What I've attempted to do in the past when discussing this is answer the next natural question. Well, how much of the cost do they bear? And the answer appears to be between 60 and 80% of all cost increases, which is a massive percentage. But of course, the utility of housing is so high, people need it so much, that as I've seen taken to say more recently, the only governor on rents is affordability in the relatively near future. There's a further piece of research out this week by the ONS on that front. But with time constraints in mind, and one important final section to consider, that will have to wait for another day. And the final section this week, of course, has to be what to do and where are the opportunities? Well, 
The move came as a shock on the SDLT front. I'm kicking myself because I mentioned it at least twice in the run-up as a likely or a possible because Labour are always keen to tell us how well they've been doing in Wales and Wales have a higher rate already. Or they had one. Now it's the lowest in the UK at 4%. Scotland has a 6% cliff on the 40k mark on second transactions and just look at the supply up there. But rent caps also have to be considered. I thought they might move to 4%, but 5% was a genuine surprise. There were no leaks on that one before the budget, but you can understand why. They tr tried not to move the market as much as possible. Just one piece that I've been quoting from the actual autumn statement summary on the government website to answer the question that many people have had, what if I'd already exchanged before the budget? Well, under the heading on the autumn budget 2024 gov.uk page, under delivering tax commitments, those who exchange contracts prior to the 31st of October 2024 are not affected by this rate increase. So, what to do? Sale agreed, renegotiate. Exchanged, don't worry, but prepare for a battle to educate your solicitors. This is interesting because it goes somewhat against what HMRC says about stamp duty in general. But you would have to consider what it says on the government website to take precedent, I believe. And HMRC not to really have the appetite to go after buyers at this point who would exchange prior to the 31st of October. So what will happen now in the immediate future? Well, you'll have noticed, I hope, that it's November now. December's up next. Many buyers will be put off in the short term, leaving the same as usual supply of properties on the market, in auctions, etc., and fewer buyers. That means the buyers that remain will pay lower prices. Can you negotiate more than a 2% lower price than last week? I would say absolutely, and I'll be gunning for 5 or 7% more off. 65 pence in the pound is the new 75 pence in the pound for the rest of 2024 anyway. Are you trading in the 125 to 250k segment? Lots of people listening will be. Well, prepare for heat, especially after Christmas, as some buyers lose their heads and do irrational things to beat the deadline. For example, paying more than 2% more for a property in order to save themselves 2%. It happens every time, time and again in these situations. It won't be a ridiculous one like April 2016, but it will be very clear in the activity. Consider sales of properties in this bracket sooner rather than later if there's any you're thinking about getting rid of. <clears throat> Still want to expand your portfolio? Well, consider the non-residential rates, which haven't changed. Six properties or more, as long as they're self-contained units, will pay the non-residential rates, for which transactions of 250k is £2,000. And that's just 2% on the difference between 150 and 250. And then it goes to 5% above that. Also consider how much more attractive limited company purchases have got. Half a percent stamp duty on shares has not changed, even if the vendor's capital gains tax position has changed from 20 to 24% on the disposal of those shares. Not a massive increase. But look, people are going to be nervous. They won't trust Labour after this, in my view. I already hear, well... Capital gains tax will be going up next year on property. And you know what? It might do. I don't think this administration will take it much above the 28% where it was, where no one was really moaning about it, before Jeremy Hunt tried a little giveaway to the core voter base before the election and knocked it to 24%. I've got stuck into a large amount of purchases over the past two months, which will now calm down to a fair amount. This was due to people selling out of straightforward fear who might well be left scratching their heads a bit after the budget if not today, certainly in weeks, months and years to come. The traders say, buy the rumour, sell the fact, which might have been a better quote for me to have used this week. But I'll stick with my ode to Rachel and her efforts, throughout which we need to keep calm and carry on. So before I wrap up one more time, a reminder that tickets for the next Property Business Workshop are out Thursday, January the 16th, 2025, with some fantastic subject matter, planning strategically, efficiencies, financial accounting and bookkeeping. No, it's not how to use zero, but it's how to ensure reporting is set up correctly and how to monitor it on an effective ongoing monthly basis. There are still super early bird tickets with a 25 plus percent discount on them. Once they're gone, they're gone. Rod and I hope to see you there. <clears throat> you can buy one at bit.ly forward slash PBW5. There's only one way you can deal with this ongoing noise and excitement. Keep calm, always read or listen to the supplement and carry on. And can I just ask those who are listening, please, as well, to give this video a like, a share, a subscribe. It helps the channel massively. 
Thanks to everyone who's tuned in today. I'm now going to attempt to answer some of the questions and comments that I got in the live chat. So thanks for those who left positive comments. Um, quick question. Fairly, someone says, I was fairly quick to criticise the Liz Trust tax cut bonanza mini budget. Are you aware the Bank of England was heavily sell bonds in the run up to the mini budget? Daniel, this is fascinating because uh, there's a conspiracy theory being pumped out there at the moment. I would be very cautious of the sources that you're listening to and you are um, taking as, as, a, as a fact, taking as read, because that is an outright lie and an untruth, right? When the Bank of England sell bonds, apart from if they have to act in an emergency, which was after the Liz Trust mini budget, not before, they go to the market and they have to indicate exactly what they're going to do when it comes to buying and selling bonds up to a year in advance. So the story that's going around, which is sort of nearly true, is do you know the Bank of England sold some bonds the night or the day before the budget or whatever? Do you know that Liz Truss and Quasi Quarting, had they bothered or had the nous to look it up, would have known that those bonds were being sold because those bond sales have to be announced months in advance? I don't suppose that you do, otherwise you wouldn't have left a comment like that. So I genuinely, and this is not directed at you, Daniel, it's directed at anybody who's falling into conspiracy trap theory holes on the internet, who liked the sound of the Liz Trust budget. Most of these places you're getting your sources of information from are funded by the right and by very wealthy people who would have loved a tax cut in Liz Trust's budget, but the reality is we couldn't afford it. And it wasn't even about the size of it, it was about the fact that you had the two most senior politicians in the country not following the checks and balances that were put into place for them. So did the Bank of England react fantastically to the Liz Trust situation? No, not really. They didn't. They didn't do a brilliant job. They didn't do a terrible job in the end, and they mopped up quickly enough. But they didn't do a brilliant job. Was it some kind of conspiracy? No. Liz Trust is a moron and a lettuce, and she had no idea what she was doing and what what that budget would do which if you'd run it by someone like me not even an internationally renowned economist by any stretch of the imagination i could have told you exactly what would happen the guilt markets would go into meltdown right so please don't go around spreading things like that over the internet misinformation does not help anybody right and then yes she wanted to review the bank of england mandate well the idea of not making the bank of england independent right making it non-independent donald trump's going for that at the moment isn't he with the federal reserve because, of course, the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve had brilliant uh, track records when they weren't independent, didn't they? Oh, no, they didn't, actually, did they? Because we had things like Black Wednesday and complete meltdowns and 15% interest rates, which within a week were cut to under 9% because the people in charge in government were so clueless that, unsurprisingly, getting four absolutely world-class economists, in the case of the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee, as independent people on the committee, and then... Granted, perhaps not the greatest governor, or certainly in terms of his economics pedigree, um, but some very, very capable people from within the bank as well, have and have then had to deal with much, much more difficult things than, uh, or at least things of equal difficulty as the ERM and leaving of the uh, the European Monetary Union and all the rest of it that, that went on in the early 90s. Um, they've done a far better job coping with things like Brexit, the pandemic, and the other bits that they've had to deal with, the financial crisis over the past 20 or 25 years. So reviewing the Bank of England's mandate, you know, Liz Truss also said, oh, I think we should take more examples from the economy of Japan. Go and have a look at Japan. They haven't grown in three decades. Like population is shrinking. They've got a worse demographic problem than we've got a massive problem with their population pyramid. And they're going to have some real, real difficulties on an ongoing basis. The reality is they were miles ahead of us some time back because they'd grown so fantastically right up until the end of the 80s. And since then, standards of living and all the rest of it have basically done nothing at all. So if you want a country like that, sure, you put someone like Liz Truss in charge, or you put someone like Reform in charge, unless they can get themselves a reasonable chance over the Exchequer, rather than the nonsense economic policies they were pumping out before the last election. So, blood pressure down, rant over. I still appreciate the comment, and I hope that everyone listening um, has got more comments and further thoughts on that, because I'm very happy to answer them. But I won't indulge in falsehoods and I won't see them propagated on the channel or over the internet without taking a pretty strong position on them. Right. And then one more comment. Uh, the stamp duty ban change is going to be really detrimental to the market in any area besides up north. It will have more impact. I, I think, Xander, you're, you're absolutely right with that comment. It will have more impact in the south and the, the impact will filter back 
across the country and you've got these double changes. Everybody's focusing on the 3% to 5%, but don't forget what it's going to do to this 125 to 250K band, you know. So it will certainly be the case that we may well be concentrating purchases on either units below 40K, great, if they're the right thing in the right area. Units below 125K because the marginal difference is not what we want to get involved in, although it doesn't make that much difference because it's marginal rather than that two gram that kicks in at the 40K level, as I said earlier on. So we've got to think about that as well. Then we're also going to be concentrating, as we have been anyway, on limited company purchases, portfolio purchases, because we're going to go to the non-residential rate of stamp on those, purchases of six units or more from the same vendor. So the way the stamp duty rules evolve are going to change. It'll also mean flips get even harder than they already are, but then flips that come out of probate comparatively become more attractive. So you'll see doors are closing and opening all over the place. The reality of this budget, in my opinion, is that more windows and doors have closed than have opened on the back of it for the moment. But the balance is nowhere near as bad as some people are making out. So we're really talking that in, in reality, you know, maybe 60% of opportunities are closed down, 40% of opportunities have opened up. It's about changing, it's about understanding them, it's about adapting your business models to them. And, you know, my sympathy to those, like I do, who have lots of employees out there in some businesses, things like care, where, no, we don't pay the national minimum wage, but we're pegged to the national minimum. We pay a premium above it might pay the national living wage um things like that that's changed what will happen as i say 60 to 80 percent of that will be passed on to our customer base there is just no two ways about it that is what's going to happen in care what will also happen is that the local authority funded residents will not accept that 10.75 percent figure that i had in there earlier and they won't put fees up by anything like that they'll say well minimum wage is up 6.7 so we'll give you an extra 4.8 percent or a number that they make out of thin air which means fewer and fewer and fewer people will be able to be funded in local authority funded care homes because they'll end up closing down because the margins are getting cut and cut and cut year on year on year and we've already gone to the well so many times with this stuff there is no more room. It's not like government gives money away. In certain areas, they do in massive ways, especially when they go into a huge project like an HS2 or a track and trace scenario or whatever, and then it's many, many billions. But don't confuse yourself with day-to-day -day business, which government, generally speaking, are pretty good at controlling the cost of. It's what they can't control at the moment that's causing the problems, including things like temporary accommodation, for example. And of course, they are controlling that to an extent because what they're doing to the rental market is forcing more and more and more and more and more people into temporary accommodation but unfortunately they don't understand that at any sort of level and i remain at their disposal to give my time for free to anyone in policy who wants to listen to the very logical and economic reasons dispassionately that i set out i often get accused on the internet of talking my own book or being involved in self-interest I don't operate like that. I look at the reality. I look at the truth. If property stopped working and I realised it before everybody else, yes, I may well tell the people who bothered to put the time into listening and reading to the supplement, but I would sell my portfolio and move on and do something different. Now, I don't see that happening because the problems that there are to fix are so great that there isn't going to be any way to fix them. And what you're going to see is more and more housing providers, and more and more local authorities leasing properties back from private sector landlords. That's my view. And I'm sticking with it, and that's why I'm staying in this market apart from anything else. I'm not here to apologise for making a profit, but people have no idea how thin the margins are that we operate to. And a 2% increase in stamp duty, which is really a 66.66% increase from 3% to 5%, will make a big difference to what we can do in terms of our volume and in terms of the offers that we make. So that's enough for this week. I appreciate people who have contributed um, and left comments, positive ones that I can actually answer to rather than some of the weird ones that I tend to get on these lives but one more request just for a like a comment uh, a subscription to the channel I'd really appreciate it thank you I hope to see you again next week all the best